Today, I want to share with you five big business failures that shaped who I am today and more importantly, how we can help you in your business. So welcome back to another episode of Hashtag Winning. Yuri L. Kame here, CEO and founder of Healthpreneur. And um, I don't know if you know many of these failures, so I want to share them with you because, you know, I, as I mentioned before, the journey to where I am right now, the, the journey for anyone who's had any degree of success uh, isn't straightforward. There's a lot of failures along the way. And I just want to remind you, if I haven't done so already several times, that anything great, anything worthwhile is hard. It takes time. It's full of ups and downs and challenges and many moments of wanting to call it a day. So I wanted to share five, what I would consider failures, although they're learnings more than anything, and specifically lessons that I think can really help you in your journey. So the first one is actually not really a business failure, um, but it's how I got into business in the first place. So when I lost my hair when I was 17, that was a failure from a health perspective. So I had long brown hair, bushy eyebrows, the whole bit. And in the space of six weeks, I lost all of my hair to an autoimmune condition. And when that happened, I was like, what the F is going on? Naturally, I was really propelled into figuring out a solution to that because I had no idea. And I didn't really know much about health. Like I was very active. I was playing soccer. I was fit, et cetera. And although I was fit, I wasn't necessarily healthy. And that was a really important lesson that I, I kind of took out of that whole experience. So anyways, so that I, I won't get into the whole story there, but basically that moment was really what opened up the door for me to get into the space of wanting to figure out more about my own health. And that eventually allowed me to get into health as a profession and helping, you know, hundreds of thousands of people to better health along the way. And then eventually you know, transitioning into building Healthpreneur. Uh, which is where we're at now. So the lesson that I've come back to over and over again, and you know, I think you know, I was talking about this over the weekend with with someone. I said that like one of the best things that's ever happened for me is the fact that I lost my hair. And it didn't happen to me. A lot of people, a lot of people say like, "Hey, man, that was really tough." The reality is, I like, it, I don't think it was. I mean, maybe my memory is a bit skewed, but I don't remember being in like going into a deep dark depression. I had a good group of close friends. I was humble. I was. I think pretty level-headed. And I think all of that allowed me to move through that process with a lot more grace. But the thing is over, over the years, what I've, the big lesson, especially in business that I wanna share with you here is that nothing matters more than your health. Like nothing, not your family, not your business, not anything. Because if all of that, like you could have the most amazing relationships and the best business in the world and the most amount of money, but if you're sick and you're not healthy, well, you're not gonna be around too long. And I have a saying that says like wealth without health is poverty. And that's something I truly live on a daily basis. I don't know if you follow me on Instagram, but every single day I post my daily non-negotiables. So I call it, I call them daily uh, alignment actions. These are things that if I continue doing these every single day, will get me closer to my goals, you know, when I'm a hundred million years old. So I have three things I do on a daily basis. I work out, I walk or run for, uh, sorry, work out for 45 minutes. I walk or run for 30 minutes and then I stretch or do some type of soft tissue recovery for 15. Those are three things just on the exercise side of things. Um, I don't really, you know, consider the nutrition as uh, structured, if you will, for, for that because I don't eat as much, if you will. I, I eat a fairly clean diet. I enjoy my morning espresso. With that said, cheers to you. But really, you know, be very, very conscious of my health because, again, I've seen a lot of people in this space, in the health space, who have compromised their health in the pursuit of wealth and they're still using pictures from 20 years ago. So, like, dude, like, you're not the same person. You're, you're 200 pounds heavier. Let's just kind of bring things down to reality. So that's the first one is the, the first kind of health failure being a really important unlock for me to, to have perspective of how important our health is. And then I think even recently, seeing a few friends pass away during COVID, uh, not because of the virus, but because of the fact that they were just unhealthy to begin with. So it just really, like I saw the impact of what that did like the business they had built, the family they left behind. And I'm like, what's the point of any of this? Like if you're not in great health, none of this matters. So that's the first thing I want to share with you. The second lesson, and this, this the first real big business failure is when I was a trainer, I was transitioning online. This is around 2005. And I, I took some advice from someone at the gym who was a business consultant. He said to me, he's like, and so this is just when I had come out, I had, I, I had recorded my, this is actually 2006, I had recorded my first online fitness program. It's called Fitter You. It was me on your headphones, guiding you through your workouts. It's a really cool program. He said, why don't you put that stuff, instead of just selling it as MP3s online, why don't you turn them into physical products like, uh, like CDs, if you remember those things, and start doing some trade shows around the country. Now, that, 
in retrospect, that would be like going to Netflix and say, hey, Netflix, why don't you open up a store and be like Blockbuster? That was kind of the backwards ass advice I was getting. But I, I didn't know any better. So I was like, you know what? That's a great idea. So what did I do? I opened up a credit line at the bank, $35,000, threw it into inventory of creating all of these CDs and physical products, which by the way, when I received the boxes at my tiny third floor apartments, took up half of the apartments in terms of inventory. And what was even better is the boxes were not even the finished product. So like you had a box for the, um, like one of the CDs and then another box had CD number two and another box had CD number three and another box had the, like the actual cardboard, but I had to kind of like the box of the thing, but then I had to like take it, open it up and put the stuff in and and bring it all together was a fucking disaster, like a nightmare. So $35,000 in inventory. And then we decided to do a couple of trade shows around the country because that was what he recommended. And I wasn't even paying him as a, as a coach. Like he just happened to me, his partner was one of my clients. And obviously we knew each other and, you know, we just chatting. And so did $15,000 worth of trade shows. And just in case you don't remember, I didn't have any of this money at the time. Okay. So I was living on, like, I was making nothing. Okay. I think my first year online, we made $6,000. And that's before we started doing some of this stuff. So I basically was living on borrowed money at this point. But I thought, you know what? I believed in myself. I was going to make it work. So uh, $15,000 to do these trade shows. Uh, we did three of them, I think. And that was a really good eye opener because when you go to a trade show, it's like you're trying to like pull people in. And I remember we were at this one trade show. Remember ShamWow? Remember like the, the, that little uh, cloth that can soak up a whole pool, pool worth of water? Well, our booth is over here and the ShamWow is right across the aisle. Guess who was getting more attention? Yeah, the ShamWow. Like literally droves of people around there and we're over here and we're like, hey guys, do you want to check out these MP3 workouts? And everyone's like, nope, I'm just here for the free samples. So anyway, so here's the lesson is, um, there's many lessons there, but the one lesson I think is very, very pertinent to you is don't take advice from people who have not been where you want to go. And that's, I think, really, really, really important to remember because I had, I don't regret anything that I've, that I've done, any decisions that I've made. I'm happy that I did that stuff because it gave me context and perspective and experience uh, of not to do it again. And obviously the nuances of like, oh, there's, there's stuff that can, that can work if we did things a bit differently, perhaps. But, you know, like, I just see so many people taking the cheap route. Oh, like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hire, um, my, my boyfriend's sister's uncle is a former marketing guy and he's going to help me with some of my business. Like, what the fuck are you doing? Like it, so many people and listen, like I'm, I'm not, I understand what it's like if you're not in a position financially to, to invest, to hire people, but like you always get what you pay for. And the worst advice is free advice. So like the worst and the most dangerous advice is free advice, which is what I got in this situation. And here's what it cost me. It cost me $50,000 that sat on a credit line for nearly a decade, okay? Because that 35 and 15, it's 50, I didn't pay that off right away. And even when I started to chip away at it, it was still accumulating with interest and all that kind of stuff. So it sat there for nearly a decade, all because I took free advice. And I want you to remember that free advice is some of the most dangerous and costly advice you can ever take. And that's why when you consider like knowing what I know now, if someone had said, hey man, I'll help you grow your business for $50,000 as your business mentor, I'd be like, you're crazy. I don't have that kind of money to spend. Meanwhile, I take free advice from someone who's like, you should do this. And I'm like, great idea. So I spend the same $50,000 only to piss it down the drain. And we all, we it's weird, like the way our mindset works in terms of these cognitive biases that we have and Anyways, so that was a lesson um, I think was a real big eye opener for me is like not taking advice from people who have not been there and done what you want to do. And even if someone has had success in some area, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's transferable to you. Like if you're talking to a banker who's done well in banking, like why am I going to take advice from a banker to grow my business? And if I'm talking to a restaurateur who has grown a successful restaurant, now that is closer to being more relevant because, okay, what are some of the lessons you've learned as an entrepreneur taking on risk, et cetera? But 
as a restaurateur, the business model itself is fundamentally and dramatically different than what building a coaching business online is. Even when we are hiring in our company, we, I mean, we get so many applications for different roles, right? Whether it's director of sales, director of marketing, you know, various, you know, other positions. And it's really, really important. Like one of our criteria is that this person has a track record and experience in the same business model. Because if you're, let's say we're hiring for director of sales and you have 20 years experience selling pharmaceuticals, and now you're going to come in and sell a higher ticket coaching program, that's not the same business model, right? If you did door-to-door -door sales and led a team of door-to-door -door sales for, you know, uh, one-hour painting or whatever it was, cool, there's some transfer, there's some translation of those skills, but it's not the same in this type of business model. There are nuances that go above and beyond the basic skills. So anyways, so that was the second lesson, the second business failure. Third business failure. So in 2009, I had this amazing idea. I'm going to interview 13 of the top health and wellness professionals who are building successful businesses online. And I'm going to interview them and figure out and get to the core of how do they stay in such good health and such good shape while building these impactful businesses. I thought this was going to be the best thing ever. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, Yuri, that's the fucking worst idea I've ever heard. So stick with me for a second. So the name of this interview series, um, you can consider it to be a summit in today's terms, if you will. So the name of the series was Fitter Than The Pros. And the idea was to give people kind of a sneak peek, like NTV Cribs, like behind the scenes look at these health professionals who had built these really big followings. And I thought it was interesting for me. So I thought, you know what? I think a lot of other people would benefit from this as well. So I spent seven months building this whole thing out, you know, coordinating, doing all the interviews, building out the funnel, the landing page, the products, you know, all the stuff that needs to go into launching this thing. So I remember going out to dinner with some friends the night before we launched this. And uh, I said, guys, get whatever you want. It's on me. Like drinks, food, whatever you want. But like, dude, what, like you win the lottery? I'm like, no, don't worry. Like tomorrow we have this huge launch. We have this, this huge new thing that we're launching tomorrow. It's going to be just the biggest thing ever. And so that's where my mindset was. Now, at the same time, I had, sorry, this is 2010, my bad, uh, 2000, beginning of 2010, because I was in a mastermind at the time, the first mastermind I joined. And I remember telling the group, I'm like, hey guys, we're doing this thing. We're launching this thing called Fitter Than The Pros. It's going to be the biggest launch in the fitness industry online. I would love for you guys to promote it to your audience. It's going to be huge. You're going to make a ton of money. You're going to help a lot of people. And I had basically said, this is going to be the biggest thing the internet has seen in our space. I had shared that with our mastermind. I had shared that with my friends. That was the mindset I came into this with. And I was pumped. So a little bit of context. So after that dinner, you know, I went to bed, um, woke up the next morning, like a kid on Christmas morning and went to check the computer, went to check the stats because I'm thinking, here we go. And I checked the stats and my heart sank. Like it literally like fell out of my fucking chest because I just saw big fat zeros. And I thought to myself, oh shit, there's so much traffic that's been sent to this offer that we broke we broke the website. Um, so I loaded the web page and the web page was fine. I went through the whole funnel, tested it, everything was fine. Then I started to really worry. Then I started to really, really panic to some to some extent because I had spent seven months and made all these big promises and we were seeing nothing. So fast forward, through this five-day turmoil of the launch, by the end of the five days, we had made a grand total of $5,000. Not seven figures, $5,000. The product was $97, and we had everyone who was part of it in terms of the interview series had agreed to promote it to their audience. I started getting emails saying, hey man, like I don't think I can keep pushing this out. I mean, I'm not getting a good conversion on my end. I'm not really seeing this to make sense. And I'm like, so what am I supposed to do? Like, yeah, I keep sending people. They're going to convert. I was like, no, like if it doesn't convert, it doesn't convert. Why are people going to continue mailing or emailing their list to get people to this offer that doesn't convert? And so anyways, at the end of five days, we made $5,000. 75% of that was paid out as commissions to those who were promoting it. So that left me with about 1500 bucks. $1,500 after seven months of work. And that was probably one of the lowest points in my business to that point. Because at this point, I had made the investment in that first mastermind. I'm like, here we go. This is this is the year it's all going to change. And for seven months in that first, you know, part of like end of 2005 leading into 2006, I thought this was going to be the, the trampoline to really grow the business. And it wasn't like it was a fucking sinkhole. So the lesson there was <laughs> there's a lot of lessons. OK, but I'll share one of them that I think is important is the first time you do something, it's probably going to suck. And I, I came into this thinking, OK, this is the first time I'm doing a launch. I'm going to crush this. No, that would be like me saying, um, I've played a little bit of tennis and I'm going to now play in the US Open final and win the whole thing. Well, that doesn't happen. 
very, very seldomly, especially if you're not a pro tennis player. So I had no track record. I hadn't even been to the proverbial semifinals or even at the US Open, metaphorically speaking. I was simply a guy playing recreational tennis. And here I am saying, I'm going to win the US Open. Okay, dude, when you come down off the whatever you're taking, welcome back to reality. Well, that's what happened is when when we take on something big or even for the first time, the reality is that we're often going to suck. It's not going to, it's usually not going to work. And I share this with my clients quite a bit because when you launch anything, whether it's an ad or an offer, it either works well or it doesn't. And, and you know, I think the difference that our clients have is they have better guidance than I had with no guidance. So there's the greater likelihood of success the first time around. However, I remind them, I'm like, listen, like you might have to write five, 10 ads before one really crushes it. It's the same thing of like, you know, this YouTube channel, I told the team uh, two years ago, I said, guys, I think we should really, I really want to focus on this uh, and make this a big piece of our business. I love shooting video. I love creating this content. And, and I want to be very clear to you guys, like, I don't care if anything comes from this in the next five years. I don't, because I know that by putting out epic content en masse, it's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time before this thing just blows up. And I don't care if it takes five years, seven years, 10 years. I've already done this with my previous channel, right? I know that by just providing immense amount of value, it's going to take off at some point. And the difference is that, you know, let's say relatively immature business owners, not that they're immature in like their character, but just in terms of their years of experience, might start something and say, all right, I'm gonna grow a YouTube channel. And then the first year they have a thousand subscribers if they're lucky. And all of a sudden it's like, this is too hard. I don't wanna keep going. I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you that anything you do for the first time is probably not gonna work. Just deal with it and keep going. The, the, like, I think it becomes easier when you realize how hard it is. You know, it's really, really uncomfortable to work out for the first time, the first several times, because you have the friggin' muscle soreness. And you're like, why the fuck am I sore all the time? What's the point of all this? But when you recognize that doing great stuff is inherently challenging, it becomes a whole lot easier. And if you give yourself permission not to be great at it, initially, you'll keep going, right? Every master was once a disaster. Every single person has one thing in common. Everyone started at zero. We didn't know how to walk, and then we did. We didn't even know how to crawl, and then we did. We didn't know how to speak, and then we did, right? And if you use these reference points, it's like, hey, well, I, could, I did this, and I did this, and I, I learned how to tie my shoes, and I learned how to ride a bike after falling over several times. Like, do you think that riding a bike the first time you're going to master it? No, like you're going to fall off the bike, right? But you keep going. And that's the lesson I learned here was the first time you do something, especially if it's you know, in a novel space, it's most likely not going to work. That's okay, because do not take feedback as failure. So the, the interpretation at the time that I took from this launch was like, this is a failure. But when I revisited that a while later, I'm like, hold on, what's the feedback? What can I learn from this to become better next time? The fourth mistake, fourth, this, this was a fun one, the business failure is... I, I think this is 2012 at this point. I had this great idea. I'm like, you know what really transformed my life was nutrition school. I think everyone needs to know what I know when it comes to nutrition. Have you ever felt that way? So what I did is I literally put together a nutrition school for everyday people. It was called Super Nutrition Academy. And it was the whole tagline was like, uh, like a it's like a bachelor's in nutrition in one hour a week, right? Something like that. And I thought this was, this was gonna be the best thing since sliced bread. I had learned my lesson. I had had some wins at this point. So I'm like, this is what, what like, man, people need this. So I spent 1,000 hours, okay? So that's one with three zeros, 1,000 hours building out this content for essentially what this was, was a membership program. So it was, um, I think it was like 47 a month or somewhere in that neighborhood. And so a thousand hours. I was in this, this this time of my life where I was still so enamored and fascinated by all the intricacies of nutrition and the physiology of all that stuff and biochemistry. And I'm like, how do I take all this stuff and, and, and give it to everyday people so they understand about how their own body works. They can take more ownership of their health. So spent a thousand hours 1,000 hours, and then we released it. And then guess what happened? Crickets. And I'm like, what the fuck am I not getting? Am I like the dumbest person in the world? Like, am I this? I'm, I'm doing this again. I'm spending another huge amount of time launching something that people don't want. And so I'm like, shit, like, what am I not understanding here? And the lesson that I eventually realized or learned was sell people what they 
wants. Give them what they need. This is one of the most common conversations I have with my clients. But Yuri, I'm not, I'm not like, I do so much more than just help people lose weight. I'm like, I do like mindfulness. I'm like, I don't give a shit about that stuff because no one else does. What is the problem that they want solved? And solve it in terms of what it's, what's being shown to the marketplace. On the inside, once they're in, you can do whatever you want in terms of giving them all the cool stuff. Like in our HBA coaching program, there is a huge amount of mindset work. Huge. Our whole health from live event was mostly mindset and some tactical stuff around AI. But we don't advertise that because what people want, I just want clients and I want to make more money. Good. Cool. Let's meet you there. Here's the vehicle. And then let's talk about mindset because that's going to get in the way. So instead of where a lot of health professionals get stuck, and this was me for a long time. So I'm sharing this because I was this guy is I'm like, this is what people need. Why can't you understand this? And they're like, dude, I don't give a shit. I just want to lose the baby weight. I just want to, you know, firm up or whatever it is. And so what we did was we, we kept Super Nutrition Academy, which was a membership program. The goal was to get a thousand people in there or more, 47 a month, you can do the math on that. But we were nowhere near that. I think like when we first launched, maybe we had 50 people in. It was just a massive flop. And we had a huge email list, 10, so hundreds of thousands of people. And so what we decided to do was, I was actually inspired by a Sports Illustrated thing that I had seen somewhere. And Sports Illustrated used to promote the magazine by giving away a football phone. So you, you get a football phone and you get a free trial of the magazine. Magazine. And then obviously some people would not want to continue on with the magazine, but a lot of people would. I'm like, huh, give people the little widget and then tie in the membership as a free trial. And that's what we did. So we started launching these small micro reports around diabetes, cholesterol, um, belly fat, and very specific conditions or outcomes or problems people had that for 10 bucks, they would get the thing and we would tie in a free month of Super Nutrition Academy. When we did that, it took off. Now, yes, people canceled after the first couple of weeks. They didn't want to continue paying 47 bucks a month. And that's fine. But using that strategy is how we got from 50 members to 1,000, okay? So I'm not suggesting, I, to be honest, I hate that business model of like low price membership sites, but we had three of them in that business. So I'm just sharing, again, I don't share anything I haven't done, right? And hopefully this is giving you context that I've done a lot of shit from huge launches to membership sites to everything. So that was the lesson is sell people what they want, not what you think they need. It was a big, 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 big lesson. And to this day, I have to remind myself of that because I still find myself kind of like, get, oh, like, oh, they can, they really need this. No, 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 dude, don't, don't play that game. Um, a lot of times we're very, we're very good at giving other people advice, but we're less good at taking our own advice that we give to other people, right? So anyways, fifth business failure. During COVID, I had an amazing idea, which was to help health practitioners build their brick and mortar. Yeah, you heard it. During 2020, I had a rush of blood to the head. I was in Australia at the time for three months, just before COVID hit. We actually were on the last flight leaving Australia back to Canada. And during that time, I said, hey guys, there's a lot of health practitioners who, like, it's just, it would be so much easier to help them grow what they're already doing, right? Instead of having them do a whole new thing, which is coming online. So we're like, yeah, let's, well, when I say we, I mean me, let's do this. So let's build up this whole program, which we did. It was called the Health Practic practice accelerator. And it was specifically geared towards helping health practitioners build their brick and mortar. Because we had a lot of clients who, although they were online or focused online, they were still using a bunch of our stuff to build their brick and mortar as well. I was like, well, wow, cool. So why don't we just, as a, as a way to expand our market in terms of who we were speaking to, let's help those looking to build a brick and mortar. And so we did that. We built this whole program, like again, a huge amount of work to build this out. Now this time, this worked pretty well, right? This was a higher ticket offer. But again, it was, you know, in the grand scheme of things too early in our journey, right? You guys know, like I'm a huge, huge, huge believer and focus on one thing and that's it until you're at a million or more. And even then, you know, it's questionable whether you should offer anything else other than like a higher end back end. So we were the 2020, like we were doing very well, but still it was like resource in terms of people, time, bandwidth, it was a little bit too premature to start a whole new coaching program with the same level of support that we're currently providing in HBA. So we did it for six months. And then I got to the point where I said, you know what, fuck this, shut it down. That's it. And it wasn't for any other reason than the following. I, I just, I looked at myself one day in the mirror or had a conversation with myself, either one. And I said to myself, why am I helping people build their own prison? 
it's philosophically against what I believe to be true. It's philosophically against why we started Healthpreneur. So Healthpreneur was not started to help health practitioners build better businesses just in their clinic. Why would I want to feed the medical matrix that is imprisoning them, imprisoning practitioners to like, here's, the, here's what I ran into is like, this is working so well, I no longer have any more time. I have less time than I did before. And now I'm like, well, maybe you should go online now and or hire some people to support you. And I just I, ha I started to have a really philosophical challenge with why we were doing this. And that was the lesson is that stick to your philosophy, not the money. Philosophically, Health Furner has always been about go virtual. I don't care if people adopt it. More people have obviously over the past couple of years with COVID. But since day one, because that was my journey, like from 2005, I said, fuck this in-person stuff. It's ridiculous. I'm going to come online and help way more people make more money, enjoy the qual better quality of life and make a dent in this world. I'm not going to do that working with clients one-on-one -on -one in a tiny radius. That was not for me. And, and then I got away from that with this offer to say, let's also help people in their clinics so they're breaking order. I was like, screw that. That's not even what I stand for. Why would I want to help someone build their clinic and then they can't even leave the clinic because they're so busy with like 120 patient visits a week. So the the decision was philosophical, was that this is not even what I believe in. It wasn't even about like people don't want it. Like the offer was good. We had people enrolling. I just like in my core and, and my team agreed with me. I wish they had spoken up earlier, but I get it. Was that like, we don't even stand for this. So we just killed it. And that was the lesson. It's like stick to your philosophy. Your philosophy is everything in business because it's what you stand for, what you stand against. So anyways, those are five big business failures that have shaped who I am today and, and obviously have allowed me to get to where I am today. And I hope one or more of these resonates with you. Whichever one resonates with you the most, I would love to know in the comments below which of the failures, which of the uh, you know experiences or lessons can you relate to. Let me know. I'd love to know in the comments below. Thank you for hanging out with me today. If you've enjoyed this episode, check out the next one, which is probably from last week. It's a really good one, and I think you'll really, really enjoy it. So watch that next after you left a comment below, and I'll see you in the next hashtag winning episode. The quality of your life is directly related to the quality of your communication. I want to talk about the one thing that has made me more money than anything else.